which would you prefer, a manual workflow that requires you to deal with your photos every day or the fully automated version that will magically surface only your best photos to you? On this episode of Tips from the Top Floor, I'll look at automated photo management versus manual photo management, two very different approaches that both have their right and reason to exist. This episode is supported by Nations Photo Lab. Refresh your wall decor with Nations Photo Lab. Choose from classic photo prints, museum quality canvas prints, breathtakingly vibrant metal prints, rustic wood print wraps, and so much more. Ordering online is easy, so you can turn your Instagram into instant memories that will last a lifetime. Make every moment matter and try Nations Photo Lab today. Head to nationsphotolab.com and use code TOP15 for 15% off your order. That's code TOP15 for 15% off. This is Tips from the Top Floor, episode 868 for June the 20th, 2019. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right, from the top floor. Hey, hello, welcome. This is Chris Markward. You're listening to Tips from the Top Floor. So here I am back after a week's break, which, which was necessary because the curious son, I, I was online there, which the internet connection is pretty good there and and dirt cheap. I think I paid. Oh, let me see. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the I'm doing the conversion math in my head. They have a, a currency called SOM, and I think seventy eight SOM is one euro. So I did use like twelve gigabytes there. And I think I paid maybe five bucks for it in total, maybe seven. So it was really, really uh, not expensive. A little external Wi-Fi hotspot with me that I use for that. Uh, but I didn't get a show out because it was it was amazingly busy. I mean, <laughs> this is um, uh, it is. Yeah, I, I hope you didn't miss me too much. But actually, <laughs> actually, who am I kidding? I know you missed me. Uh, so today, I, I, yeah, I have a topic that I've touched on uh, on in the past. It's about workflow and how things are changing over time. Um, it's also something we talk a lot about on the future of photography.com on the other podcast I do. Uh, but, but I recently had an epiphany that puts a whole new twist on this. And I spent the last two hours writing this down, putting some structure into that so it, it doesn't come across as too incoherent. And that, that thinking process was was triggered in Kyrgyzstan. Well, not triggered there, but at least, um, what's the word? Solidified. Um, because I took over 6,500 photos in Kyrgyzstan, which for a two-week photo tour is more than I take, usually. And that reignited some thoughts on, on workflow. Because, I mean, I, we were shooting... A long time every day and uh, lots of different kind of photo ops there which was amazing um but uh, uh, that amount of photos um you come back to the hotel it's relatively late like 9 p.m you know you'll have to get up early in the morning but then you still want to get your batteries charged and stuff prepared for the next day and at work on your photos because i mean i pride myself in being done with my photos the moment I return home. And uh, so, yeah, that reignited some thoughts on workflow and, and why I'm doing all this, especially as uh, as I said, this Kyrgyzstan tour was very photo heavy. Now, now I know I sell these photo tours, right? So um, <clears throat> they're all very much about photography, but of course they have different amounts of photography. And Kyrgyzstan was definitely on the photo heavy side um, because it was worth it. I, we had to. It was not not an option not to shoot because it was such an amazing country. Uh, and in average, it ended up being 500 photos a day that I took. And that puts my workflow to the test. My one hour, 1,000 photos workflow. And of course, it also begins uh, asking the question why I'm not using any of the cloud-based photo services that take a lot of that work off my hands. So that's what I want to talk about today. But first, a few words about the photo tour and about Kyrgyzstan itself, because Kyrgyzstan is probably one of the most underrated countries on this planet. I I had great expectations. 
Um, its name is hard to spell. The people are really laid back. Uh, they're super open and free. People are not camera shy at all. Um, Kyrgyzstan has overwhelming landscapes, wonderful light, a great mix of different cultures. It's affordable. There are abundant photo op opportunities. Uh, on some of those days, we had up to 10 distinctly different opportunities. I mean, they, they, they have beautiful mountains, different climate zones, wide valleys, rolling hills with the sunlight skimming the slopes, like clean air, great colors. Um, over half of the people in Kyrgyzstan live of farming. And that's horses and, and sheep and cows, uh, lots of animals there. Uh, but if, I don't know, like 6 million people live there and 30 million sheep, which is fairly close to the what it looks like in, in New Zealand. Um, uh, people live really close to nature, uh, which you see, for example, like the horses. The horses are a means of transportation. They and a means for uh, getting milk. Horse milk is a thing that uh, the Kyrgyz people love. I didn't try it there, but um, they have this national drink, which is kind of some fermented horse milk. Um, and in the countryside, I mean, you will see people just using horses as workhorses, right? Uh, the sheep herders are doing this from horses. Uh, they are nomads. They have a nomadic life. Um, they live in yurts, uh, which are these specially shaped tents. And if I was asked what it's like there, I mean, you have different climate zones. You have the, the lush green rolling hills. You have areas that are like the Black Forest, just much bigger and more impressive. Uh, you have deserty areas, right? There's uh, areas that would remind you of, uh, of Utah. And the route we took was, was also interesting because we started in the capital in Bishkek, which is a modern city. And then uh, we went out to Izik Kul Lake, which <clears throat> is a is a, it's a very huge, big lake, and uh, we circled that one clockwise. And again, yeah, you get in these different climate zones, from lush green hills to desert-like areas. There are big flats uh, to to mountains that surround the green valleys. Uh, Twenty three thousand foot mountains, right, with snow on top. Uh, visually stunning. And we, we attended the traditional Kyrgyz horse games, which is like a fast-paced game, not that much unlike polo, but just faster and physically very demanding. It was breathtaking to see that and to be able to photograph that as kind of as special guests on the sidelines. Um, we spent time on a, on a ship on the lake, which was great. We visited people in their yurts. We invited we were invited into people's homes when when people saw our cameras. They often approached us. And asked us to take their photo. I mean, these are such friendly and heartwarming people. Uh, there was one shepherd that we met who came over to us on his horse. I mean, on the back of his horse. And he rode over to us and rode next to the bus we were driving in. Uh, and, and offered us some of the bread he was having. As Western tourists. Because that's the way these people are in Kyrgyzstan. And... We saw eagles close up. We saw falcons. Eagle hunting is a tradition there. So, and it's not it's not people hunting eagles, but it's people hunting with eagles. So they team up with eagles, and then the eagles um, are hunting animals for them. And we visited churches, and we visited mosques, and uh, we. <laughs> I mean, there's a, some things just stay in your mind. We spontaneously did a photo session with a family who came from a festival, and they wore. Uh, traditional clothes and there they they were so happy for us to spend time with them um and take photos of them i mean they, they would just, yeah i haven't seen that openness in in other countries in that area uh we were at the annual children's festival which is like a whole day that belongs to the children and that includes free rides in the, at the fairground i've never seen so many happy kids with an ice cream cone in their hands and smiling parents to go with it uh, we've slept in in modern hotels, in traditional guest houses. Uh, we spent even one night in a yurt. Uh, we did some horseback riding because that's what you do there. Uh, I had a bath in a hot spring, um, optional, but it was great. It, it was yeah. It, I'm I'm very excited about this place. Um, and photographically, I mean, this must have been one of the most diverse countries that I've ever been to. Um, that's that's I'm not I'm not exaggerating here. 
Uh, they had some of the finest landscapes um, to photograph. Wonderful people. Uh, there, there are like 16 different nationalities in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, very expressive faces, great wildlife, birds. We've, um, for example, we've seen kingfishers, we've seen bee eaters. There were eagles, there were falcon. Um, a lot of great opportunities to play with panoramas, to play with HDR. We did a lot of composition exercises, some people photography, uh, street photography, cityscapes, sports photography. Yeah, the, the, the horseback kind of thing the polo thing um we even hired models on a couple of days uh some with modern interpretations of traditional clothes which um and some with actual traditional costumes and uh it, it, the working with models again two out of those or three out of those uh 13 days um we had those uh, for for half a day each And working with models was new to a few of the participants, so we turned that into another great learning opportunity. And then, yeah, again, the street photography. I remember Osh Market in Bishkek. What what a variety of people and foods and other stuff, and all combined with, with great light in there. Um, oh, and one more bonus. I love to... Uh, at least occasionally fly my drone and capture a few unusual perspectives and some video. And Kyrgyzstan is both gorgeous and very drone friendly. And I managed to get a few really great shots and videos this way. So I, I could go on and on. This is one tour that we'll do again. That's guaranteed. Actually, I've already put the next year's Kyrgyzstan tour online. Uh, so it's ready to book. Um, it's pretty much the same date as this year, early June which also turned out to be another bonus because it's perfect timing because it's early in the season and we encountered almost no other tourists. So we had many of the places for ourselves. Nobody else was there, which again, huge bonus. So we're coming back early June next year. So mark your calendar or go to discoverthetopfloor.com for more info about that. Well, next up, the workflow. <laughs> But before that, just a quick thanks to this week's sponsor, HoneyBook. If you run a creative business, you know how to make your clients look good. But if you're struggling with tedious administrative tasks, let HoneyBook do the work and make you look good. HoneyBook is an online business management tool that lets you control your client communication, bookings, contracts, and invoices all in one place. If you're a creative freelancer or small business owner, HoneyBook helps you stay organized with custom templates and automation tools. You can even use HoneyBook to consolidate services you already use, like QuickBooks, Google Suite, and MailChimp. Over 75,000 designers, event professionals, or photographers have saved hundreds to thousands of hours a year. It's your business, just better with HoneyBook. Right now, HoneyBook is offering you, the TFTTF listeners, 50% off your first year with promo code TOPFLOOR. And again, that's 50%, 50. Payment is, of course, flexible, so this promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. Just go to HoneyBook.com and use promo code TOPFLOOR for 50% off your first year, get paid faster and work smarter with HoneyBook.com, promo code TOPFLOOR, and I thank them for the support. Again, let's, let's revisit workflow because times change and the whole area of post-production changes. I mean, let's look at um, stuff like Apple, Apple's iCloud Photos, Google Photos, because a lot of work there is being done for you. And so it's definitely worth having a quick look at. Um, and of course, <laughs> the question is, is post-processing necessary or is it just a chore? And uh, modern platforms will use machine learning to automate a lot of that for you. Um, and if I wanted to classify the things that I do with my photos, there are two major tasks to be done with my photos. And the first is the photo management and second is beautification. Uh, management includes the sorting, the tagging with keywords, the rating by quality. And in the end, all those are all measures to enable me to find those photos later. The management part, uh, will make them findable. I guess, uh, we all will have that problem down the line. I mean, if you're anything like me, you'll have digital photos on your hard drives or in the cloud. That they'll easily go back 10 years or more. And if your memory is great and you can just pinpoint any of your photos and go to the folder it's in, hey, good on you. But over time, 
your photos will drastically increase. The amount of photos will increase in, uh, and your memory won't get better as you get older. Uh, so in my book, making it easier to find your photos is crucial. So we'll go into more detail on that. And then uh, be the beautification. Uh, that would be stuff like fixing your contrast and adjusting colors and burning and dodging. Uh, fixing geometry, perspective correction, fixing chromatic aberrations, adding extra contrast to areas, uh, applying clarity or dehazing, straightening horizons, making bracketed exposures into HDR, stitching panoramas, all the things that I'd consider either fixing things that went wrong during exposing the photo or creative decisions. That is all highly individual. What's, what's needed is different for each photo, but that's something that also is undergoing some change over time. Um, the tools change and the workflows change. And of course, everybody has different requirements here. So your needs might be completely different from my needs. But again, those are the two major areas I want to go a bit deeper on in the context of changing technology. And that's the photo management and the beautification of photos. But before that, again, just a quick Thank you to this week's other sponsor, and that is Vistaprint. Small business owners know that the most important time is now. Being prepared when an opportunity comes up is crucial, and having a business card in your pocket ready to hand out that shows how professional you are is the first step. With Vistaprint, you can create a truly professional, unique card in minutes. Simply upload your design or start with one of their professionally designed options. Then pick the paper stock style and quantity that's right for you and choose your delivery speed. You can order and receive your cards in as few as three days. Your next big opportunity is coming right now. All it takes is $10 to feel like you are ready to own the now. That's a low price to have the confidence that you're always ready to make an impression. Plus, your satisfaction is 100% guaranteed or they'll make it right. Vistaprint wants you to be able to own the now in any situation, which is why our listeners will get 500 high quality custom business cards starting at $9.99. Just go to vistaprint.com slash top floor. That's vistaprint.com slash top floor. vistaprint.com slash top floor. Thanks for the support. Back to photo management and photo beautification. Um, 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 again, let's look at how photo management is changing. And the biggest changes that I see come uh, coming through, through machine learning. Machine learning is doing a lot in our photography these days. Um, let's begin with a capture. If you take a, a capture, and again, I'm talking the, the, the cloud-based systems here uh, that are mostly related to the smartphones that we use. Um, your smartphone cameras shoot a series of photos, if you like it or not. They're not just one picture when you press the shutter button, multiple ones, and then they choose the one where, for example, the subject doesn't blink. Um, during management, making it easier to find the photos you're looking for. That's that's the goal here. Um, or I, I think the official term is making it easier to surface the photo you're looking for. Um, uh, so today, if you use the search function in your um, software, again, let me use Apple Photos and Google Photos as the two prime examples here. Uh, if you search for photos, the, <laughs> the results can be almost magical. And the way this is powered under the hood is a very interesting mix of different technologies. Because, of course, initially there will be the EXIF data. Uh, so let's look at GPS, for example. The fact that GPS-tagged photos include location coordinates makes it almost trivial to search for places. So you will be able to easily surface photos that have been taken at a specific place. And then, of course, the date is part of the photo, so finding pictures from a specific time frame is easy. Or the combination, let's say I'm searching for pictures from Lofoten in Norway uh, that were taken in 2017. Again, that's easy. But it goes far beyond that, because in addition to the EXIF data, there is now machine learning generated metadata that makes all this go much deeper. And uh, one of those is face recognition. Now, I personally, I can only speak to Apple's iCloud photos um, and Adobe Lightroom Classic because those are what I use, but uh, I'm sure Google isn't much different. So with Apple photos, the moment you begin training the system on a specific face you and you do that by like you swipe up on a photo and then tap on people, 
Uh, it'll begin finding photos of that same person in other contexts. So as a result, I can now search for pictures of Monica that uh, that I've I've taken in Norway. I can combine those two things and then uh, find pictures that that I have not tagged with Monica or Norway, but uh, the system is doing that for me. Uh, but in addition, machine learning on those platforms will also kind of recognize objects in photos, right? Object recognition, thousands of different objects. So if I'm looking for pictures that have, uh, I don't know, bon Monica in them and flowers, then that's now possible. And all I had to do was take the photo and at one point begin tagging Monica as a person. And uh, the flower part comes for, for free. It's built into the system. And then the GPS info is also automatically added to the photo but it goes even further than that because there's a feature uh, in apple photos that's called memories which again surfaces pictures for you and not just any pictures but pictures in specific contexts and what they do is they yeah they automatically select photos for you that kind of belong together and they make them into a little slideshow for you with music and um well, let me see. There are here a few examples from my library. I'm just uh, looking at that. Um, Berlin, August 2015. There was I was there in, in Berlin, and I took photos on that day. So it, it made those into a slider. Oh, <laughs> this one is good. Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyz Republic, June 2019. Look at that. When I open that one, and I press... Let me press, press play on this one just for a second to get... An idea, so it starts now. And I'm seeing pictures from Bishkek. Here's a carousel. Uh, here's a statue that I took a picture of. Two policemen. A band playing in a public square. Children from the Children's Day doing a little dance as penguins. And someone on an electric scooter. And I don't, it, it's just beautiful moments that... It puts together, I'm just zapping through that. Landscape photos. It, it's done a really good job putting that together. And uh, I've looked at this earlier. I like this so much that uh, I already put it online on YouTube. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, I didn't have to do a lot of work on that. I changed the title a bit. I uh, deleted one or two photos from it that didn't belong there. Um, or that were just not interesting enough. But it's really interesting what kind of photos and video snippets it shows. And it did this based on machine learning. It did this based on analyzing the photos on the device. It does that and uh, it even cropped some of them for me. There's a lot of smarts in those systems these days. So that is really uh, helping to surface things. Now, of course, <laughs> my personal big issue is that I still live in two parallel worlds here. And there's the, there's my Apple world, which I just talked about, which mostly has photos that I take with my iPhone. And uh, then there is the, the pro photographer world that I live in. And those photos live pretty much in Lightroom. And no, I, I won't go into the whole subscription model discussion, Adobe. Uh, I did that back in episode 849. So if you're interested in that, tfttf.com slash 849. But anyway, the parallel worlds, that's really something that I still don't know how to merge because photo management there is, in, in this pro world, is a partially manual process. Every night on a photo tour, I spend half an hour going through my photos, classifying them, rating them, keywording them, um, making them beautiful. <laughs> and this is my way of surfacing the best photos. This is my decisions, right? And that takes a bit of work, but... Um, so, so a natural thought would be, how can I make this easier? But as much as I'd love to save some of that time, I recently had an epiphany that made it pretty clear to me that uh, why that workflow is kind of important to where I am as a photographer. Uh, but more about this bit later. We still haven't talked about the area of, uh, of photo beautification. And there's so much interesting... Uh, stuff going on in that area too and we're back to the AI driven machine learning driven cloud based systems uh, but also at the uh, looking at the cameras themselves um, during image capture if you hold up your smartphone your camera will white balance your photos and it won't 
just do this based on given algorithms, but it will base, do that based on knowing what's in the frame. I mean, especially based on face recognition. The, the skin tones are so important in photos. If you'd have people on the photos, you want their skins to look natural. So I've now seen this several times where I pointed the camera at something and uh, there was no face in the photo and the smartphone came, camera just chose the white balance, a decent white, ba white balance. And then when a person entered the frame, that white balance changed. The moment the camera identified the face and drew a frame around it. And you can just try that yourself. Um, it is amazing how smart these things are getting. And then there's auto HDR. That's just one example of many, but uh, smartphone cameras will capture multiple photos every time you press the shutter button, not just one. They begin capturing the moment you switch the camera on and they capture even after you press the shutter button. So uh, they'll take several of those exposures and assemble them into a photo, even into an HDR photo if the dynamic range requires that. Uh, used to be a feature that you could turn on and off, and now, at least in iPhones, it's always on. It's just not something that you turn off. And then I'm, I'm very, very sure that modern smartphones uh, or more, modern, modern smartphone cameras will also do a selective color correction to different areas of the picture. I mean, grass is green, right? The camera sees grass and recognizes grass, and then uh, they'll probably do something to that, to that to make it look more like grass. And then the sky is supposed to be blue, so... Uh, that, that gets enhanced for sure. The skin is skin tone, right? So that part is uh, changed too. And I'm, I'm very confident that a lot of uh, that is happening in the cameras now. But that's, that's the image capture. The photos that come out of today's smartphone cameras are already kind of pretty good, out of the box. But then in post-processing, I mean, the, the, have you pressed that smart auto fix button? Um it's amazing what this stuff can do. And also when, when the camera when, or when the photo system creates a memory for you, what I just, the video I just exported, it'll do crops for you, it'll select the best out of a series of photos, and so on and so on. So photo management and photo beautification are more and more automated today uh, for us. And when I look at the pro photographer part of my workflow, again, that's Lightroom Classic. Then that's also quite a bit more manual, right? I choose the white balance. I choose the crop. I will burn and dodge. I'll make parts of the frame darker or brighter. I'll change contrast in parts of the photo and so on. And of course, my workflow helps me. Uh, so I only have to do that to select a select set of my photos, not to all of the thousands of them. So... Um, there is quite some optimization in there already, but let's get to the epiphany that I had, and it's about the, necess the, the, the necessity of this workflow. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, the necessity of this manual workflow. Because one thing that I realized is that I think as a photographer, it's also important to have a framework that forces you to spend time with your photos. And this could be hanging them up on the walls, printing the best ones out, but I think you will also have to spend time with the photos that are not the best ones. And with an automated system, it's so easy to not spend time with your photos after you took them. Uh, and that means you will not have a chance of becoming better because that's one of the ways we learn, right? And let me just let me compare that with two other things in my life where I had the same epiphany over the years. And the first one was when I played in in bands. You know, as a musician, I mean, one of my most important uh, pieces of gear was well, of course, the instrument itself. But then, uh, second important was the little mini disc recorder that I had because I wanted to become a better musician. So I recorded my own playing and I recorded our band practices and I would listen back to to uh, what I recorded. Um, I would listen back to how, uh, well, not just how I played, but how the band played together and what mistakes were made and uh, where I had sloppy intonation or imprecise rhythm. And then 
I would go back and work on those areas to improve, to become a better bass player. Um, or if you choose your instrument of choice, if you're a trumpet player, you know what I'm talking about. If you, if you practice any music instrument, you know what I'm talking about. If you are a golfer, you will record your golf strokes on slow motion video or hits, what you call them. I'm not a golfer, I know. but you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You want to be able to improve. So you record and then you deal with what you did and you go through the motions to become better. Um, so the act of spending time with your successes, but also spending time with your mistakes, I believe is crucial. It's essential to growth. And that was many years ago when I did this uh, with music. But the same happened, I don't know, five, six years ago when I began to be more serious about my finances. Uh, that's when I began to budget, when I began to confront uh, something that up to that point, was more scary to me than I care to admit. Which is why before that time, I tried to ignore it, you know? I tried to procrastinate it away and, life from page and live, uh, live from paycheck to paycheck. But only the act of dealing with this on a, on a regular basis has allowed me to learn and to grow and to change. And I would argue that the same is 100% true for my photography. The fact that after a day of shooting, I spend half an hour with my photos... I sort them and I decide which one is worth working on and which one should never see the light of day. I, and I straighten horizons and I look at the contrasts in a mountain range and I decide how dark I want the shadows in comparison with how bright the snow on the mountaintops is. And then I decide which of the photos I, works, uh, I worked on deserves to be a four-star rating or even a five-star photo. This regular process has two major benefits for me. And first... I'll be finished with working through my photos and that lets me sleep at night. It's a little bit like an inbox zero kind of thing. You know, uh, so much peace of mind because I know that I didn't miss a good photo. I know that if I decide to press the delete button on all those rejected photos, I know that only bad photos will be deleted. So peace of mind is a great motivation here. But a second... And more important, I have grown as a photographer by spending time with all my photos. I'm not handing my babies to a nanny because I kind of want to be a good parent to my photos, right? <laughs> so before choosing convenience over, over having to put a bit of work into your photography, you might also want to think about what that could mean for your growth process. For me personally, it has made and keeps making all the difference. And that was it for this week. Thank you so much for your continued support. And also thanks to Honeybook and Vistaprint for supporting this episode of the show. If you like this episode, you can, of course, buy me a coffee at tfttf.com slash coffee or consider joining the ranks of all those amazing patrons over at tfttf.com slash Patreon. And again, of course, those of you who support this show deserve to be part of it. So here are the wonderful people who actively support tips from the top floor in the order of the support tiers. Jeremy Kirvin, Jeffrey Block, Alex Crozo, Bernhard Goldback, Daniel Hertrich, Doug Gabbard, Ken Davidson, Marco Binder, Matt Armstead, Peter Morrow, Scott Wurzel, Tom Stewart, Aaron Pinasov, Stu Silverman, Alan Bruce Horn, Andrew B., Anthony Bartek Boski, Chad Leigh Clark, Chandra, Christopher Greenhill, Dave Smith, David Recht, Francesco Scaglioni, Greg Anastasi, Holger Krupp, James Trimble, James Caldwell, John Donahue, Josh Harpko, Jasmine AMR, Ken Berrien, Kyle Nishioka, Marvin Aaron, Michael Grunert, Peter M. Spradling, Rob Duba, Robert Goshko, Ryan Gilio, Zina Fahad, Steven Sandler, Thomas Nielsen, Trevor Palmer, and Woody. And I thank you all so much. If you want to hear your name on the show, consider joining this illustrious group of awesome people at tfttf.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much. 
Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner, Headspot, Kagrut Publishing, and Slack Challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Rasseter, Armstead, Slack Invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. The link to get on the Slack is in the show notes. My name is Chris Markward. You'll find me on social media at Chris, M A R Q U A R T T. Now go out and take amazing photos. Share them with the world. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting. <laughs> <laughs>